we were talking about you. We've been talking about you a lot ever since you took the gig. But the past couple of weeks, you have found yourself in a position yourself and Ross in a position where I would argue uh, the fan base, the media, if they're talking about your club, they're talking about you guys first. You know, everyone's got a reaction to you guys. Um, A lot of it has been skewing negatively. I mean, you you probably know that you're here. You you listen to the radio, pick up the papers. You know what the fans are buzzing about. Um, Has that been uncomfortable for you? What, What have you made of being in the spotlight the way you've been in the spotlight? Yeah, I mean, I I don't even really, you know, listen, I'm bitter. I'm frustrated, not because of that. I just don't like not winning. And so I think what comes along with not winning is frustration, um, you know, anger. And if it's placed on me, then that is absolutely fine. I think what I've found over the last couple of weeks is, some excitement you know i look out at the field and see jansen and kevin biggio and bo bichette and vladdy and guriel and fisher and see us make incredible strides in the way we're competing night in and night out over the last six weeks and run differential and competing in close and late games and say i can start to see the pieces in place and i can start to see the way these guys are playing together as teammates the leaders that are being formed that the championship teams of tomorrow are kind of starting to transform right in front of us so um the the you know the the external stuff will always be a level of frustration until you win you got to win that's the bottom line and winning will make everyone happy both with the players and hopefully just people have people just not focus on the front office because it's not about the front office well i i think you're 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 right about that i mean ultimately um you know you win. yeah exactly right it, it probably doesn't matter much what you say or how transparent you guys are going to be or try to be um if you lose games people are going to harp on you if you win games uh, no one really cares what you have to say absolutely that's uh you know i i uh had great great piece of advice from bill parcells you know a long time ago when it, i was at uh, a dinner and he he basically said in not quite as uh, prime time words, he said, nobody gives a damn and uh, or nobody gives a crap. And you can guess it wasn't crap. And he was basically telling me in his own way, like, nobody cares, man. Your job is to find a way to win. Like, doesn't matter situation, circumstance, doesn't matter resources, doesn't matter, you know, anything else going on. Like when, you know, it, the job is don't make excuses, figure out and find a way to win. I think that's what has been encouraging for me over the last two, three weeks. And, and month, you know, as we started to watch these guys play and you start to see the quality of Kevin Biggio's at bats, you see the way Vladdy embraces Bo when he comes up and makes him feel comfortable. You see the way Bo immediately embraces the spotlight and the environment and, um, you know, the potential of Derek Fisher that our, both our scouts and our analytics guys and our front office staff believe so strongly in. And Lourdes Gurriel struggling up and down, up and down, up and down, and then kind of hit his stride so it's it's never you know that straight path development is always kind of a you know has some bumps and and a little bit of a roller coaster along the way but the potential talent and the track record of these guys I think is starting to be more obvious and talking to the teams that we're playing across the field they're feeling us like they know like damn those guys are going to be good you know they're they are we do not want to play them and they're it's only going to get worse Mark, I think one of the most overused words when there's any sort of management change, coaching change, is culture. We have to change the culture. But when you came in here, it was a winning culture in 15, 16. And how do you go through the sort of the transformation of that and say, okay, that's not quite the exact winning culture I envision. I envision something different. And if you do, what is that that you envision differently? No, I think it's just winning. Uh, Culture often follows winning. I think when I think about culture, it's more linking the major league team to the player development staff, to scouting, having an identity for the players that we want to have represent this city, this province, and this country, and making sure that our scouts, our development staff, and our big league team all understand what that looks like. And as we're scouting players, as we're developing players, as we're trading for or signing players, and as we're building a major league team, that that there's some synergy to going about that and there's a link between those things but as far as the major league environment you know not not a question of it being different just a question of it being a winning environment with mark shapiro the president and ceo of the blue jays but i think that's what what dave's saying is in 15 and 16 you won 
and you yeah, made it to the LCS. We couldn't, unfortunately, we couldn't cryogenically freeze those players. And you know, right, but that doesn't have to do with culture. That's because they couldn't play anymore. Uh, is what I'm you're not, saying. And I'm not saying the culture has to change. I'm just saying we have to win. Right. Um, in terms of you're, these, you're saying that. Well, but you've you've mentioned that word many times, right? You you do talk a lot word, about culture. I've mentioned that word as as a way to build an organization, not a major league team. I think when you think about the major league organization, and a lot of fans is, are not even going to think about that. It has to do with scouts that are spread throughout all of North America, Latin America, and Asia. It has to do with a player development system that's got eight teams going from the Dominican Republic to you know uh, Bluefield to Lansing to Vancouver, you know, to New Hampshire. So there has to be some link for us to be able to do exceptional things and to compete and win in the ALEs sustainably. And I think that's the key word. We want to have a sustainable championship team. You know, we're going to have to be exceptional in what we do. We're going to have to be exceptional. That's just a reality. And so I think when we talk about building an organization, uh, we want to have one that has a strong set of values and that people feel they believe so strongly in what we're doing that they do exceptional work our scouts are the best scouts our analytics staff is the best analytics staff our strength and conditioning staff every single person's got to feel like the work they're doing is important and that they're you know have an important part in bringing world championships back to canada and back to toronto with mark shapiro um regardless of of how you got here you know there's been a lot of a lot of turnover and a lot of pillars within that clubhouse are are now moving on or have moved on um, it, guys like Donaldson, Tulowitzki, Stroman, Sanchez, etc. And it's coincided with these kids coming up and obviously having a big impact like Vladdy, like Bichette, like Biggio. Um, it's a clean slate, so to speak. It feels like it's a clubhouse that, that is available to them and they can make an impact and kind of uh, mold it the way that they choose almost from day one, even though that is a big responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, was that a part of the plan? And if so, how can that be beneficial for these young guys? Well, I mean, I think we knew at some point, again, it had less to do with, you know, uh, kind of opinions on players and more to do just with the age and lining up talent. You want players to be in their prime together and you want players to kind of, a core of players to have a chance to win sustainably for an extended period of time. And so um, as these guys were coming up in the minor leagues, Ben Sherrington, Gil Kim, Eric Wedge, their focus was not just to develop them as talent, but to do unique things to talk to these guys about what it means to impact each other as teammates, what it means to foster an environment uh, and an atmosphere where the expectation is to win and how they can impact that, not just on the field with the way they play, but with the way they treat each other as teammates, with the way they support each other. So we've spent a tremendous amount of time and energy trying to do what is extremely difficult, which is to get 20, 21, 19, 22-year-olds to think about their opportunity to lead, their opportunity to be accountable for and own a team and an atmosphere, and just the importance of winning, that, you know, winning is much more meaningful than just being in the major leagues. Young players tend to be happy to be there, or once they make it, they tend to be focused just on making money. But, you know, the ultimate fun and the ultimate meaning to a career is winning, and so we've spent a lot of energy and time talking to our guys about that. Mark, do you think sustainability is getting shorter and shorter in pro sports? Now, you don't deal with a salary cap. You deal with a luxury tax. But it just seems, other than arguably the New England Patriots of the four major sports, that it's just become shorter and shorter and you have a, your window is shorter and you've almost got to decide when that window is. Yeah, you got to make a call. Baseball, yeah. yeah, Major League Baseball is a specifically – uh, it's the toughest of all the major league sports because there is no salary cap um, and and revenue sharing is so disproportionate. So the NBA has disproportionate revenue sharing as well, but they have a salary cap. So major, major league baseball, that creates extreme gaps between the largest resource markets like Boston and New York, L.A., um, from, you know, smallest markets, so where I came from. And, you know, I think if you're one of the smallest markets, you need to come almost have constant churn and make tough trades and trades that, you know, are, are really, really painful on a fan base. But I think if you're anywhere in the top 10 markets, if you build it, 
you know, correctly and you do the things I talked about organizationally, the potential to build a sustainable winner is there. It does involve active roster management, meaning you want to kind of want to balance that team between being not getting too veteran laden, having a balance of players in their prime, uh, always commit to some young players and then keeping some veteran players around. But um, the danger can be if you skew too much towards the veteran side, uh, it tends to be more of a cliff, you know, when you pull back than, a, than more gradual. Well, in terms of where you find yourself today, um, you know, the, a lot of the, the moves you've made over the past two or three weeks have been about the future, have been about control, moving on from veteran guys. Even if they're not being paid now, they were, they were planning on being paid very soon. Um, is, it, is it the in, intention now of yourself, of Ross, of ownership in the organization that any moves you're going to make um, you know, from here on out, I know you can't make any until we get to the off season, but it's going to be about, okay, let's start winning now. Like let's go into next season and improve our club, not take steps back and start thinking of three, five, seven years down the road, but put more of an emphasis on emphasis on improving um, and trying to pick up wins in 2020. Well, I can absolutely say it's, you know, the focus is not going to be on three, five, seven years down the road, and the focus is going to be on moving from competing to winning. Uh, we still have to go through this period of you know, committing at-bats, committing innings to young players to know what we have internally so we can then supplement through trades and free agency around those players. Uh, but again, I think that we are competing now. You know, we're competing already. Now we have to turn that competitiveness into wins, and that can involve a lot of different things, including the environment uh, that Charlie Montoyo and the coaching staff have created around learning and development and growth at the major league level um, and competing, which we're doing, you know, night in the night out so you know i would think as we look at the off season it's not going to be about subtraction it's going to be about addition um and again just the only thing we're going to be balancing is just making sure we're still finding out about our young players we had ross on earlier in the week and um he compared where you guys are today to where the astros were in 2014 in terms of player uh, like positional players you know matching up altuve correa Springer with with the likes of Bo and Vladdy and and Biggio um, and they had 70 wins in 14 86 in in 15 now they had Keiko really step up McCullers made an impact I don't see the the pitching syncing up based on where you guys are currently with your system and what the rotation is today but do you share that that same impression uh, impression of where your club is and in the projection where basically if you're yeah. connecting those dots I mean playoffs is that a possibility for next year I don't believe that we should put any limitation on ourselves. I think our players, as you, if you'd spend time and you had a front row seat to be with our guys in that clubhouse, which I wish I could just move you into there and move all of our fans into there so they could feel the positive energy and the belief these guys have in their talent and in each other. Um, I don't, I don't know what the pace will be. You know, I don't definitely don't want to compare it to any one single team. Uh, but I also don't want to set any limitations on it. I think if we come out of next spring training uh, and we stay largely healthy and they, we continue to improve at the pace that we have over the last six, seven weeks, um, that there shouldn't be limitations put on what we can accomplish next year. Uh, Ross also emphasizing, you know, the building up of of the organizational depth and the amount yeah. of pitchers that you guys have faith in. Again, I don't yeah. know when they're going to get here. Nobody knows when they're going to get here. But putting drafting and developing aside, we know the two other mm -hmm. options are you either try, uh, you, you trade for help mm -hmm. or you sign uh, for help. Historically yeah. in Toronto, it's been difficult to get the bigger names to sign here. Um, so what, what would you suggest is the more likely avenue for elite pitching coming aboard if it's coming from without, uh, from the outside of the organization? Is it, is it trades or is it signings? Yeah, I don't, man, that's hard to forecast because there's so, it's so hard to know when the opportunities present themselves. And again, I think it has to do a little bit with the timing of our team and where we are and when we're there. Um, you know, I think any player, you know, who would want to come here and would want to play here, I can't imagine that's, it's not an attractive place to be, particularly if we're winning. Um, I still feel like you want to use free agency to supplement, not necessarily to, you know, to build your core players. I'd like to think that those elite guys are going to come from Pearson, Manoa, with Richardson, Klofenstein, you know, who knows, maybe someone will surprise us like a Waggis Peck or a Thornton, but 
you know, a Merriweather, if he's healthy, he was throwing 100, you know, at times during his rehab this year. So I, I'm not sure, you know, it's hard for me to say. I just I, I know that we're, we will be aggressive and supplementing when the time's right. I saw a picture of you on the field, uh, I believe, during batting practice this afternoon, chatting with Bo Bichette. Um, what, what's your personal relationship with the players? I mean, how, how much communication do you feel is necessary from a guy in your position? Um, there have been different times in my career. My personal relationship with players has been a lot more consistent, a lot stronger. Uh, I talk to our players as they come through the farm system. I talk to our players when they get to the big leagues. And, you know, I'm around the team, certainly in spring training frequently, and try to be around to be supportive now. I think what's most important is to continue to communicate to our players that, you know, our interests completely align with theirs. We're here to help them be the best players they can possibly be. We want to pay them a lot of money because if we do, then they're playing really well and we're winning ball games. And we want to do anything possible to help them be the best they can be. And so, you know, our job is to proactively do that, but also to listen to them and ensure that they've got the resources, the support, uh, and the belief that they need from us to be the best players they can possibly be. So fostering an atmosphere where they feel that support, they know that we're pulling for them, they know that we care, um, you know, that's really important to, to have from top to bottom. How do you feel about the job uh, your manager, Charlie Montoyo, has done in terms really? of the kids in particular? Yeah, really excited about Charlie. I mean, he's uh, such a positive guy, so consistent, uh, so at peace with himself, and he is so open, too. You know, it's so rare to find a guy that's, that's ascended to that level of the game and is open to ensuring that his staff has his support and are empowered to make an impact, that he wants all the information, all the, all the ways possible to make our team and our players better. Uh, and then I think, you know, if you talk to our guys, there's just an undying, you know, positive energy and support he's got for each guy on the field, which helps them be the best they can be.